my, my pleasure to welcome the first speaker for the proposition tonight, Ryan Hoey. Um, opening the argument for the proposition, Ryan is a recent politics graduate from Queen's and an honorary life member of the Terrific. He campaigned for vote leave in the EU referendum in 2016 and stood as a candidate in the local elections in England in 2018. An impassioned voice in student debates at the Terrific, he is someone you can always rely on for a piece of private member's business when you need it the most. It is my pleasure to welcome Ryan Hoey to have the floor for the first time. for you to sit back down to start the time. Um, thank you, Mr. President. It's a pleasure to be uh, speaking in this debate as an architect of our uh, great debate series. I'm glad to finally be able to contribute to one. Given the current uh, political impasse, it's also great to see this chamber actually being used for debate and discussion. Uh, indeed, if the current vacuum is not filled by the end of this week, I would suggest that the Literific is invited to form the provisional government of Northern Ireland. Before I begin, as is customary for the first speaker at uh, these sorts of things, I'd like to say a few words of thanks to our guest speakers or introduce them. On my side of the debate, we have two former MEPs, uh, Diane Dodds, who served in the executive during the most difficult periods of the COVID pandemic. Jim Allister, I've always admired for his oratory and clarity of thought, and I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say uh, this evening. And uh, we also have Robbie Butler, who you may not know, took part in the Literific's karaoke fundraiser last year. <laughs> and gave us a beautiful rendition of Mr. Blue Sky. Um, then on the opposition, we have Kate Nicholl, I think we can all agree, regardless of our uh, politics, was a fantastic Lord Mayor of Belfast. Emma D'Souza, who I debated uh, alongside um, in Dublin only a month ago, and let's hope that this debate goes a bit better for my side than that one did. And last but certainly by no means least, uh, Matthew O'Toole, who by now must hold the record for the most uh, speeches given by an elected official to the Literific. So turning to the motion, this House believes the protocol has negatively impacted Northern Ireland. I'm sure the opposition will argue, as I've heard Matthew make this point before, the Union's concerns around consent should basically be dismissed because Northern Ireland didn't consent to Brexit. I'm sure they'll also argue, and indeed Emma tweeted as much the other day, that the protocol has protected us from the worst excesses of Brexit. Taking these points in turn, being part of the United Kingdom means some decisions, such as membership of international bodies, will be taken on a UK-wide basis. The EU referendum of 2016 was a national referendum, and the United Kingdom as a whole voted to leave. That decision on a reserve matter had to be respected. But we should, of course, have tried to implement a settlement that all sections of the community could live with. What we've ended up with, with the protocol, is, is a protocol that not a single unionist representative can support. And this is a problem because Northern Ireland operates on the principle of parallel consent. To give an analogy for my nationalist leaving, leaning friends, if we ever voted to leave the UK, we would have to find a settlement that addressed some of the losing side's concerns. But that couldn't involve the parts that voted remain basically remaining. Referendum results by their very nature um, cannot have parallel consent, but the ultimate, the ultimate settlement should, try, uh, should strive to achieve the maximum possible acceptance from both communities <coughs> in Northern Ireland. The DUP are receiving a lot of criticism for their refusal to establish an executive until the protocol is addressed. However, if the, indeed there are some within unionism who agree with, uh, disagree with that uh, approach. However, if, this, if the same level of checks and controls that now exist down the Irish Sea um, were applied to the border with the Republic, Sinn Féin would have undoubtedly have taken a similar course of action. In January 2020, I wrote a piece arguing that the implementation of the protocol should be as light touch as possible. I said at the time that negotiations on the next stage of the Brexit process were vitally important in determining how the protocol would operate in practice, and urged the then newly established executive to be a powerful voice for protecting east-west trade, pointing out that Northern Ireland trades more with the rest of the UK than with the Republic of Ireland, the European Union and the rest of the world put together. When the EU signed up to the protocol, they de facto, although not officially, became co uh, core guarantors of the Belfast Agreement. How they approached its implementation would determine whether we could maintain the delicate balance between North-South 
and east-west uh, uh, so essential to its success. However, the EU's singular focus on protecting their single market and the calls from some parties um, for the rigorous implementation of the protocol have, have prevented such a settlement from being reached. That is not to say that the UK government is blameless. From the 2017 joint report onwards, the government accepted a one-sided interpretation of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, that it prevented a border on the island of Ireland, but allowed one down the Irish Sea. This was always an odd interpretation, when the Belfast Agreement explicitly reaffirms an international border on the island, unless and until there is a majority to change it. Now, I, I accept that there will always be a UK-EU treaty relationship to manage our unique circumstances. But we need to get to a situation where the practical and constitutional concerns are addressed and find more flexible and ultimately more durable arrangements that can command support from all sections of the community. This means continuing to protect the integrity of the EU single market, but also fully respecting Northern Ireland's place in the UK customs territory and the internal market. Trade should be differentiated by making it the uh, responsibility of the trader to declare the final destination of their goods with steep penalties for those found to have misled the authorities. The original intention of the protocol or supposed intention of the protocol as described in its preamble is to reaffirm, is to affirm and protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. However, it is the protocol itself that is now a major roadblock the re-establishment of these institutions which are the cornerstone of that agreement. The opposition may want to plough on with a newfound spirit of majoritarianism but that simply won't work. Rather than goading opponents of the protocol we need a recognition of the economic problems caused by its overzealous implementation and a consciousness of why it so deeply stirs passions of unionists, remainers and leavers alike. The protocol is negatively impacting Northern Ireland. I commend the motion to the House. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for your fantastic speech for the proposition tonight. It is my pleasure to welcome our second speaker, opening the argument for the opposition this evening, Dermot Hamill. Dermot is a first year student at Queen's University Belfast, currently studying politics and international relations. Uh, outside of his studies, Dermot is also the chief editor of the podcast and online student blog Youth Voice NI, where he interviews politicians on the current issues facing Northern Ireland. As an active member of the Literific in his first year, Dermot's first ever speech was five weeks ago. And we're immensely proud of the progress that he has made since then, and this is his first ever speech with guest speakers, so I would appreciate a particularly warm welcome for Dermot tonight, and Dermot, you have the floor. Well, this place is a bit scary, isn't it? I am going to, similarly to Ryan, thank all of you for coming. It is an absolute honour to be here, Stanton and Stormont. It, there is a little nine-year-old boy inside of me who is freaking out at the idea of speaking with politicians at Stormont, never mind actually going up the steps. But moreover, we're going on to the protocol, which is obviously Northern Ireland's favourite issue at the moment. But to get to the protocol, you have to look at Brexit, because it is obviously part of Brexit. So. As I always say whenever I want to ruin a dinner party, let's talk about Brexit. Northern Ireland didn't vote for Brexit. Now, Mr. Hoey did, no, but we didn't. Northern Ireland, as a, the majority of people here did not vote for it, both unionists and nationalists alike voted to remain within the European Union. But in the spirit of majoritarianism, we were taken out by English nationalists and the Conservative Party, and I suppose we have them to thank for it. But, let, but on the protocol, the idea that it negatively impacts Northern Ireland, well, I'd have to disagree. Uh, between 2021 and 2020, NI trade with the EU rose by £500 million. And in an age of growing interconnectedness, isolationism is not the answer. English nationalism is not the answer. And that is not the answer for Northern Ireland. It is not the answer for people here. And as a result, we need to be working together. We are a more global world, so we should be making Northern Ireland a more global place. But let's look at the dual market approach. 
it provides a unique opportunity for Northern Ireland. And I know that Mrs Dodds will agree with me because as uh, Sir Geoffrey Donalds and her party leader said, customs checks do do doesn't mean that you change the constitutional status of a part of the UK. Already we're seeing political parties and business leaders coming together to see how we exploit the opportunities that come from this situation. Opportunity, that is what the protocol is. It is all about providing us with opportunity. We are ge geographically, we are on the same island as the Republic. There is no denying that. So a hard border down the, by South Armagh and Dundalk is simply not going to work. It, it, it has been tried. It failed. Believe me, I come from South Armagh. And, well, if you look at trusted trader schemes, they've worked so well in the past. And that is why we have a massive red diesel market in South Armagh. But in the eyes of some, the NI protocol completely damages Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom. And while I am no staunch unionist, I'd have to disagree. Uh, in my opinion, it actually strengthens the union, which, to be honest, isn't a great thing for my brand of politics, but I guess we have to suck it up. Because in my eyes, it makes NI more economically viable. Now, basic logic suggests if people are happier, if people have more money in their pockets, people are more likely to support remaining within the union. Go for it. Um, in my speech, I mentioned about how we need to find more flexible arrangements. Was well, not more flexible arrangements that actually uh, differentiated goods based on their origin, because we trade more with the rest of the UK than, like I say, the rest of the world together, be more economically advantageous. We can keep some of the benefits, but also address some of the issues that do exist. I absolutely would have to say that amendments could be made to the NI protocol. We could make more flexible arrangements, and I'd have to agree if we could. I would totally support that. But as I said, one of the big kind of issues that were put forward was the idea of trusted trader schemes or you know different lines for bringing in goods into Northern Ireland. Well, it doesn't work. We we have seen that it doesn't work. I mean, you can't expect someone that is importing into South Armagh. For example, I'll use that because that's where I'm from, and is importing something from the United Kingdom, let's say it's batteries or something for their, you know, for the remote controls. How, how are we supposed to stop someone there from actually just bringing it into the Republic and therefore damaging the EU single market? That, it will be damaged, and as a result, we cannot expect the, the European Union as a massive economic power to turn out and say, oh, well, you know, we have to kind of, we're going to damage your market in the name of making sure that people in, you know, Bangor can get can get slightly cheaper batteries, it's not going to work. It, and, and as a result, it will damage our relations with the rest of the world, which in a growing interconnected world, in a world where Northern Ireland has become more diverse, in which we are welcoming more people here, we are providing opportunities for students to travel abroad in, in the EU through the Erasmus scheme, as more people are picking up Irish passports, there is no point trying to damage our relations with the European Union. It simply will not work. We have massive opportunities. There are more firms are investing in Northern Ireland. There was actually very recently, during the Brexit process, there was a development uh, just south of the border. Uh, it was called Dundalk North. It wasn't north of Dundalk, like it was way north of Dundalk. So I have a big issue with the naming. But the idea was it was meant to be a massive kind of industrial park, I suppose, similar to Spruce Field. And the idea behind it was to exploit the opportunities that would damage Northern Ireland and companies would eventually leave Northern Ireland for the Republic because there was the idea that there would be greater opportunities there. It didn't work. And now Dundalk, Dundalk North, as it's called, now has really, really, really nice footpaths but no businesses to walk along them. So my friends, I urge you to oppose this motion, to join us on the cause of the protocol. The protocol is not perfect, but the Brexit deal was far from perfect either. The, I'm not a man to stand and defend the actions of a Tory government, but at the end of the day, we must stand and protect the protocol because we must protect our economy. We must protect the opportunities that are given to our young people to make sure that we, as a future, can stop our brain drain, having a more economically viable Northern Ireland. It will protect our place within the Union, which at this moment in time is quite possibly our best option for Northern Ireland, whether or not you are a nationalist or a unionist. At this moment in time, what we need is stability. It is time for the for politicians to get back in the room together. Well, we've got you all here to, to get. So maybe we could get some negotiations going, I don't know. But it is time to get back into Stormont. It is time to back the protocol. And I hope that you will, that you will oppose this motion tonight.
you, Dermot, for that fantastic speech. Before I continue, I'd just like to ask, can you put your phones on airplane mode? I don't know what that noise is, but it might be someone's phone, as Robbie has said to me. So um, if you put your phones on airplane mode for a second. And while you're doing that, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome the second speaker for the proposition tonight, Diane Dodds, MLA. Uh, Dan was a member of the European Parliament from 2009 to 2020 and has been a member of the Democratic Unionist Party in Upper Band since January 2020, uh, serving as Minister for the Economy from January 2020 to June 2021. And prior to her political life, Daniel worked Dan. Dan worked as a teacher in Laurel Hill High School uh, in Lisbon, teaching history and English, as well as supporting pupils with special educational needs. It is my great pleasure to welcome Diane Dodds, MLA, to the floor. Thank you, uh, everyone, and it is a great pleasure to be taking part in this debate today uh, in this particular very historic chamber uh, in this House, and also to speak in favour of the proposition that this House believes that the protocol has negatively impacted on Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland Protocol, as conceived by the EU, lobbied for by the Irish Government, and voted into law by a British government desperate to get Brexit done, has divided opinion here and in Westminster. It has subjugated Article 6 of the Act of Union and has trashed democratic norms in this part of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland is now subject to a whole range of laws which are made by a foreign political entity. Laws which govern huge swathes of our economy over which we have no say, and which will take us on a different trajectory to the rest of the United Kingdom as divergence increases with the passage of time. This negation of democracy is having a hugely negative impact on the democratic institutions in Northern Ireland. In this House of democratically elected politicians, it is a statement of fact to say that unionists oppose the protocol. Now, I have spent many years of my life, as Matthew has said, listening to European politicians who swear that they want to safeguard the Belfast Agreement in all of its parts. Some thought that was very important. Yet the very same people, and indeed many of the political class here, want to ex ignore that very same agreement, which sets out a position on the principle of consent, as being the consent of the two main communities here in Northern Ireland. Surely we must agree that this is a hugely negative impact of the protocol. Northern Ireland works best when we have consent from all for a functioning democracy. It is this lack of consent from unionism and the failure to deal with the protocol which has led us to the situation where we have been unable to establish a functioning government in this part of the United Kingdom. I believe in devolution. I believe that a stable, prosperous Northern Ireland is good for all of us. I want to see devolution restored. However, as Sir Jeffrey Donaldson said recently, the protocol rubble needs removed if the devolved government foundations are to be stabilised. It is quite simply impossible to proceed if one part of our community is marginalised and its views ignored. We need a firm foundation for the restoration of local accountable government in Northern Ireland. And on this day of new beginnings in Westminster, I would urge our government to deal speedily with the Northern Ireland Protocol and restore democracy and sovereignty to this part of the United Kingdom. Well, the, yes? Right. Okay. So, um, I, 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 I take your point of view, and I uh, um, accept uh, that that is very firmly held by you. But democracy 
and the definition as defined by the Belfast Good Friday Agreement means that we need to have the consent of both peoples who live in this part of Northern Ireland. And without that consent, we cannot have a community that is able to go forward. And it's really important for democracy to function that we get that consent um, for um, uh, from the unionist community. And we will not get consent from the unionist community for a Northern Ireland protocol that negates democracy and actually uh, undermines our sovereignty. The practical outworking of EU law in this part of the United Kingdom has of course many consequences. As citizens of the United Kingdom, we are denied the benefits of UK-wide tax changes because we are subject to EU VAT rules. This was clearly demonstrated when Northern Ireland was unable to benefit from tax reductions on energy saving measures. Our businesses are tied to EU state aid rules. These rules under, uh, determine the circumstances in which local businesses are aided by the Exchequer to grow and invest, or indeed they govern the basis for attracting companies from overseas to set up in Northern Ireland. As the rest of the United Kingdom develops its own competition policy, this will inevitably mean that our companies are tied to the more stringent EU laws which will make us uncompetitive in our largest marketplace. The protocol has negatively impacted the cost of doing business in Northern Ireland. Our logistics companies report that the protocol is driving up the cost of doing business by 30%, a cost that will ultimately be passed to the consumer. Indeed, in evidence to a House of Lords committee in Belfast, the commercial director of one of the largest logistics companies, McBurney Transport, said that the protocol was reducing consumer choice and ramping up cost. He went on to say that if the protocol were fully implemented, then trade between Northern Ireland and GB would grind to a halt within 48 hours. Of course, on many of these issues, the United Kingdom government has extended grace periods. The EU response to that has been to take us to the European Court of Justice. The Northern Ireland, and um, they say, in a conversation with them, they say that this is because it will act as a deterrent should they ever dare to pass the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. On medicines, and I will wind, um, on medicines, and it's very important, we understand that a recent um, answer from the Health Minister tells us that medicines moving from GB to Northern Ireland are handled as though they were entering the EU because we have to follow the EU a key. And again, the government has said that our compliance with the falsified medicines directives risks divergence with the medicines market between Great Britain and Northern Ireland and will lead to increased costs for Northern Ireland's health service. At a time um, of looming um, crisis uh, in terms of the cost of living, it's hard to actually uh, say that there is a positive in some of this situation. The protocol has caused a crisis for our institutions. It has caused a crisis for the Belfast Agreement. It has undermined our ability to achieve stable functioning government. We have to face the fact that it also is difficult to fix the NHS when the health minister says that our medicine supply is at risk. It's difficult to build new schools and hospitals when the protocol adds 25% tariff on steel, and it's difficult to help with the cost of living when the protocol adds 30% to transport costs for households <coughs> and blocks tax breaks for our communities. The protocol has had a negative impact on Northern Ireland. It's time for it to go. I urge you to support the motion. Thank you very much, Diane, for that fantastic speech. Uh, it is now my turn to welcome the second speaker for the opposition, Kate Nicol, MLA. Uh, Kate is a, was a Belfast City Councillor from 2016 to 2022, before serving as Lord Mayor of Belfast from June 2021 to May 2022. And Kate was recently elected as the first time MLA for the Alliance Party in South Belfast in this May's recent Assembly election. It is my pleasure to welcome Kate Nicol, MLA, to the floor.
thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Um, uh, as uh, the President mentioned, I am a recently elected MLA. This is my second time I've had the opportunity to speak in one of these debating chambers. And with a potential election looming, I thought it would be appropriate to bring my husband and baby along because they may not see me perform ever again. <laughs> Without context, um, there's no contest. Uh, the, the protocol has negatively impacted Northern Ireland. But without context, nothing has any meaning. Without context, the appointment of a new prime minister may seem like a momentous occasion. With context, you can see actually, it happens more times than Jim Allister tables ministerial questions. So context is key. And the context here is Brexit. The Northern Ireland Protocol exists because of Brexit and because of the choices made by the UK government and the DUP. It is far from perfect. In fact, my colleague Naomi Long, whilst in the European Parliament, and my colleague Stephen Farry in Westminster, voted against these um, when better arrangements were still at least notionally available. It was always going to be an imperfect situation because, frankly, there is no such thing as a good and clean outcome if the UK and Ireland are not aligned within the customs union and the single market. Brexit presented a trilemma, three options when you can only choose two. One, a hard Brexit outside customs union and single market. Two, avoiding a border on the island of Ireland. Three, avoiding all checks across the Irish Sea. Many of us warned from the beginning of the referendum campaign that Brexit was always going to entail new barriers and frictions. Coming out of the EU meant that there would be a trade barrier. It was just a matter of where. The border between North and South is crossable, as um, my colleague said, in hundreds of locations, in lanes, in fields, in streets. Therefore, the most likely and simple place for any trade barrier was going to be our ports and airports. It's just simply easier for the authorities to manage. This isn't to discount the impingement that this does have on people's sense of identity, and I don't want to discredit that. What I want to recognise is that the Northern Ireland Protocol is not the cause of these barriers and frictions, it is the response to that. The proposition will argue that the Protocol is an attack on the Good Friday Agreement. That's just not true. The Protocol is the means by which to protect the Good Friday Agreement from the damage of Brexit. It's not a perfect solution. Brexit was pursued recklessly with no consideration of the implications it would have for a shared Northern Ireland, the interlocking relationships which have allowed us to function, and for the Good Friday Agreement. The protocol seeks to manage and reduce the impact on the interfaces, and while it can't eliminate all friction, it offers a soft landing for the Good Friday Agreement and to protect it as far as possible. By contrast, removing or scrapping the protocol threatens greater challenges to the Good Friday Agreement. The proposition will try to rewrite the understanding of the protocol and its relationship with the Good Friday Agreement. They see the protocol as a threat to it. Yet the mainstream view is that the protocol protects the Good Friday Agreement. Article 2 of the protocol also deals with other aspects, such as protecting the rights of people of Northern Ireland under the Good Friday Agreement. One argument that is frequently made is that the protocol does not have consent. It's important to be clear that consent under the Good Friday Agreement is only strictly speaking in relation to constitutional change. There is an irony that those questioning the consent for the protocol didn't seem to mind the lack of NI specific consent for Brexit itself. Again, back to my point, the Brexit vote was the great disruptor of the Good Friday Agreement settlement. Brexit was the original sin. The advocates of a more expansive interpretation of the principle of consent did not adopt that approach to the original Brexit decision. The protocol can be seen as necessary response to address the fallout from a Brexit that didn't consider, consider the implications for Northern Ireland. Some will argue it's bad for business. However, they ignore the relative opportunities for Northern Ireland from the protocol in terms of dual market access. These should be maximised. Yes, there are challenges, but our energy should be committed to finding as many mitigations and flexibilities as possible. Some of these can be found inside the protocol. Beyond that, the protocol allows for supplemental agreements to be made to it. In addition, the UK-EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement allows for new agreements to be made, such as a veterinary agreement. A hard Brexit necessitates the Northern Ireland Protocol or some similar set of protections. Yes, the challenges it brings need to be minimised, 
but the relative opportunities need to be maximised. It is important Northern Ireland retains access to the EU single market for goods. The only way forward lies through negotiations. Trust is the key ingredient in both making progress and functionality of many outcomes. By contrast, the protocol bill is a dead end. Unilateral action and breaking international law are entirely counterproductive. Indeed, the bill threatens Northern Ireland's access to the single market. There is a clear landing zone around many challenges. However, we can't be under any illusion around the scale of the gaps needing to be bridged and the timescales that may be involved to reach the solutions. As I said at the beginning, context is key. The protocol is the product of Brexit, and in particular, the choices made by the government and many unionist politicians who pushed for a hard Brexit. In the absence of any plausible alternative, it is the means to address the challenges posed by Brexit to a shared and interdependent Northern Ireland. Those who oppose the protocol continue to engage in fantasy politics, calling for what is complete removal, but not providing any workable solutions um, for what would replace it. The Northern Ireland Protocol has not been damaging to Northern Ireland. No, that blame lies with the proposals, the protocol's biggest objectors, those who sought and delivered Brexit. I urge you to oppose the motion. Thank you, Kate, for that fantastic speech. It is now my pleasure to welcome the third speaker for the proposition, Jim Alistair, MLA. Jim was a member of the European Parliament from 2004 to 2009 and has been a member of the TUV in North Antrim since May 2011 and the leader of the party since 2007. Additionally, Jim was called to the Bar of Northern Ireland in 1976, specialising in criminal law before being called to the Senior Bar as a Queen's Counsel in 2001. It is my great pleasure to welcome Jim Alistair, MLA, to the floor. Thank you very much, Mr President. I would suggest to you that whether you are pro-protocol or anti-protocol, it's impossible to disagree with this motion, that the protocol has adversely impacted Northern Ireland. Look around you. Economic blockades in terms of our free trade biggest partner. Stormont upended. And the unionist community alienated. How could you say other than there has been adverse impact? Diane has told us of the economic impacts, and they are dire, because GB is our biggest market. I want to focus to you, and yes, mine is an unapologetically unionist approach to this issue. I want to focus on the huge political and constitutional impacts of the protocol. And to me as a unionist, whether you like it or not, the essence of the offence of the protocol is the fact is the fact that it decrees and operates on the basis that GB is a foreign country. And when it comes to trade, because it is a third or a foreign country, we'll have to check its goods. So if you arrive at the situation that whether you're bringing goods from Bolivia or from Britain, it makes no difference. Subject to the same uh, imposition of customs checks. Yes, make it quick, please. Just on that point uh, about divergence in treating EB and Northern Ireland as different countries, just to raise that up to 1972, the prior Unionist government actually had in place that we needed work permits to come between EB and Northern Ireland. Well, if I could find some relevance in that, I'd answer it. But let's be very clear. <laughs> let's be very clear. That is what cuts to the quick. The fact that GB is decreed to be a foreign country, that is what makes the protocol unbearable for any unionist. And then when you add to that the fact that we are now governed by laws we don't make and can't change, it has been rightly estimated that up to two-thirds of the laws 
that govern our economy, that shape those things as how you manufacture goods, how you package them, how you sell them, how you trade them, that up to two thirds of the laws that govern our economy are not made in Belfast, not made in London, but made in a foreign jurisdiction. Well, how can that be right? If you're a Democrat, the very essence of democracy is that you're governed by laws you make in your own country. I see some people in this, down this side of the table tonight who pride themselves on their anti-colonialist uh, history. I have to tell you, under this protocol, GB is now an EU colony. We are treated subject to laws we don't make made by a foreign power. The new colonialists are sitting on my left. Those who think it's right, those who think it's critically important to govern a place by laws handed down from a foreign jurisdiction. Colonialists of 2022. They might laugh, but they laugh out of embarrassment because it is the truth. Some of them call themselves, they even have democratic in their title, Social Democratic and Labour Party. And yet, yet, they are those who say, we might want to be members of this assembly, but we want to tip our cap. We want to make ourselves beholden to a foreign power so as we don't make our laws. We gratefully accept the crumbs that Brussels give us. We don't need to have law-making powers. We're quite happy, like the colonials that we are, to accept the hand downs from Brussels. So if you are a Democrat, I don't care whether you're a nationalist or unionist, but if you are a Democrat, then this protocol is something you could never come to terms with. Yes, whoever it was. Thank you. Right, let's be very clear. I've heard it said here more than once today, Northern Ireland didn't vote for Brexit. That's right. But the question on the ballot was not, would you like Northern Ireland to stay or remain in the EU? The question on the ballot, being a national question, would you like the United Kingdom to stay or to leave? So the outcome was always to be a national outcome. You might as well come to me and say, oh, London voted to remain. So what? It was a national question. And the question certainly wasn't, do you want GB to leave and leave Northern Ireland as a colony behind? And that is the fundamental offence and obscenity of this protocol, that we are left as a colony of the EU, subject to the rules of someone else's single market, someone else's customs code, someone else's VAT regime, and here you gather today to vote in favour of that being a great thing. I do want to say to you, you'll come to the day without regretting the fact that you traded your democracy so cheaply. To sell it out for what? The pottage of a protocol? Really? Anyone who's a Democrat needs to get hold of the fundamental realities that either we believe in being governed by the laws we make in our own country, or we want to just merely be the subjects of foreign jurisdiction. I certainly don't want to be. And you, by your vote today, will decide whether or not you're a colonialist or an anti-colonialist. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for that magnificent oration to the House. Uh, it is now my pleasure to welcome the third speaker for the opposition, Emma D'Souza. Emma, yes, uh, Emma, is, <laughs> Emma is a writer, political commentator, journalist and campaigner, in addition to being the chair of the All-Ireland All Ireland Women's Forum. 
uh, in 2019, sorry, it's not 2019, it's a five-year uh, court battle, um, she had a high-profile court challenge against the British government that changed domestic UK immigration law, reaffirming the identity and citizenship provisions of the Good Friday Agreement and securing EU family reunification rights for all citizens of Northern Ireland. In May 2022, Emma also stood as an independent candidate in the recent Assembly election. It is my great pleasure to welcome Emma Sousa to the floor. Thank you very much, Matthew, and to everyone for being here. I don't really know how I'm supposed to follow that, Jim. You put on quite a show, so a challenge for me to go next. Um, listen, I am here to encourage you all to oppose this motion. And I'm going to lay out my arguments in three parts. One, how the protocol was created, a bit of context, as Kate put earlier. Then speaking about the benefits of the protocol that we have seen and addressing the ways in which some political parties and representatives have misused the protocol to further their own political agendas. As has been said previously, the Brexit referendum in 2016 resulted in a narrow 52-48 UK-wide result, with Northern Ireland as a region voting 56% remain. Nationalists, Unionists and those who describe themselves as neither voted to remain a part of the European Union. The UK and Ireland's joint membership of the EU made our fragile peace more viable by enabling connections and removing physical, economic and psychological barriers. The UK's withdrawal from the EU was always going to result in borders. And whilst checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland are not ideal, they are less visible, less intrusive, and less disruptive than checks along the land border. There was little support for Brexit in 2016 in Northern Ireland, and there's little support today. Recent polling has shown in a survey from Queen's that 59% of respondents actually said that Brexit is bad for all of the UK and a majority support the Northern Ireland Protocol as the best means of dealing with Brexit. Now to the benefits. Against the backdrop of political instability and rising tensions over the Northern Ireland Protocol, local businesses have cautiously and quietly been taking advantage of our unique position. I, for one, think it is wonderful that County Down-based sandwich company Delhi Lights now has pretty significant contracts with supermarket giants instead of British-based sandwich firms. Local dairy cooperative Dale Farm secured a major supply partnership with leading European dairy business Art of Foods, thanks to our dual, Marcus, Mar dual market access. Northern Ireland exports are up by 1.5 billion in just two years. A recent report by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research said Northern Ireland's economic output outperformed the UK average due to the outcome of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Not to mention that when the rest of the UK couldn't get McDonald's milkshakes or Nando's, we were grand. And it isn't just businesses that are seeking to take advantage of the protocol. The YUK document from the UK's Department of International Trade describes Northern Ireland as the only place in the world where businesses can operate free from customs declarations, rules of origin certificates and non-tariff barriers on the sale of goods to both the UK and the EU. All of our political leaders and representatives should be trying to maximise the advantages and opportunities that the protocol can present to businesses and communities alike instead of coming out in force to support British sausage suppliers over the many local high-quality producers in Northern Ireland. On that point, Go for it. If, people in, if consumers in Northern Ireland choose to buy local goods or choose to buy goods from the Republic, that's fine. But it's the fact that there are bar artificial barriers put in place from goods coming from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. So it's reducing consumer choice. The fact that people have swapped is not positive because they've been forced to swap by artificial barriers and the Irish city. Well, I for one would always encourage local producers and having a positive impact on our own local economy over outsourcing the benefits to Britain. But on that point, I do think there can be mitigations that can support consumer choice and I support that. But the cause here is not the protocol. The cause here is Brexit. 
Brexit is destabilizing. One need only look at the chaos in Westminster as a fifth Prime Minister takes office since the 2016 vote to see that. The Conservatives are still chasing the sunlit uplands of Brexit, and so are the Brexiteers here in Northern Ireland who refuse to embrace the competitive advantage of the protocol. The DUP were the only major political party in Northern Ireland to campaign for Brexit. Sorry, Jim. And they were the only major political party to protest against the Good Friday Agreement. And currently, they are the only party blocking the formation of a Northern Ireland Assembly. To me, that is not democracy. The Good Friday Agreement is predicated on the principles of equality, parity of esteem, and mutual respect. It is, uh, by and large, a compromise. No one party satisfied all of their demands. Rather, they find a way forward in the spirit of generosity and compromise. Unilateral action and absolutionist approaches strike at the very heart of our peace process. Northern Ireland remains a post-conflict society still grappling with intergenerational trauma. Several areas continue to language steeped in deprivation with as many as one in four children living in relative poverty. That will only get worse this winter. The Northern Ireland Protocol could transform the economy if only the politicians would let it. It is not the cause of conflict, but the solution. Can it be improved on? Yes, absolutely. But it remains the best means of safeguarding our peace, protecting our businesses and recognising the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland. Because let's not forget that many of us are European citizens too. And just on a final point around consent, because it's been mentioned here plenty, and as Kate has already said, consent under the Good Friday Agreement is clear, as well as under the Northern Ireland Act 1998. It applies in specific and limited circumstances. It applies to a border poll and cross-community voting, again, in specific and limited circumstances. And of course, Ryan, I'm sorry to say this, but when you speak of unionist consent, and you ignore a comparable consent from other communities for Brexit, well, it seems that the only consent you're interested in is your own. Thank you. It takes me so long to get around this room. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emma, for that fantastic speech. It is now time to turn to the closing. Do you know how you're going to get out of it? You can just go around that way. OK. Um, <laughs> the fourth speaker and closing for the proposition tonight <laughs> is Robbie Butler, MLA. Prior to being uh, elected into politics, Robbie worked as a butcher, a prison officer, and a firefighter before being elected to Lisburn's and Castlereagh City Council uh, with the Ulster Unionist Party from 2014 to 2016. With a swift rise in politics, Robbie was elected as an MLA for the UUP in Lagan Valley in 2016 um, and was appointed Chief Whip for the party from 2020 to 2022, in addition to becoming Deputy Leader of the party in May 2021. It is my great pleasure to welcome Robbie Butler MLA to the floor. I'm not being ignorant or anything, but when he presses that, when I start, guys, I have to get this out, okay? Happy enough? Mr. Yeah. President, okay. The abiding key to peace, stability, well-being and prosperity is, in fact, democracy. Many of the speakers today have referenced that. Some 25 years ago, this wee country created with what some have described as having ugly scaffolding, an agreement that had the blessing and endorsement of over 71% of the population of Northern Ireland. It perhaps was the first time in our history that unionists, nationalists and others came together to agree on the way forward and a way to create a better future. As someone who was born directly at the halfway mark uh, of Northern Ireland's centenary in 1972, and one who has witnessed both firsthand and through osmosis the wickedness, the trauma caused by the troubles, I still support and champion an agreement that was remarkable in what it achieved and what it delivered. The Good Friday Belfast Agreement heralded a life and future for my children and all of us relatively free from the spectre of malevolent and violent hands of terrorists and paramilitaries from across all of our communities. 
The delivery of this agreement was costly to many, especially those who served, and I was one of those, a former prison officer, and one who had many friends who served uh, uh, selflessly in our security forces. I can testify that agreeing to that, the cost was huge. However, I still believe that peace was a prize worth grabbing. Today's debate, however, is about the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, on Northern Ireland, and more importantly, from my perspective, to accurately outline the negative impact of the same. They say that success has many fathers. This is true right around the globe. And the Good Friday Agreement is perhaps the perfect example of that. An agreement achieved with support from the majority of political parties here in Northern Ireland, with support from the United Kingdom government and the government of the Republic of Ireland, along with welcome assistance from senior U uh, US politicians and their government administration. And for years, people have proudly used and heralded their involvement. They're not slow to tell us. But sadly, their understanding of the agreement and its three strands show that there evidently is almost zero bipartisanship. However, it would be wrong to ignore it, it has been mentioned, and it would be mischievous of me to not hold to the point that we are in this position today due to Brexit, which is indeed the parent of the protocol. Or, yeah, that is the parent of the protocol, and I, and I can accept that. But I and my party warned and campaigned against Brexit, like many within this room. We did this not solely from a Northern Irish Unionist perspective, but indeed from a United Kingdom Unionist perspective. It was clear that Northern Ireland, due to its land border, would bear much of the impact and cost, both fiscally and as a society. But similarly, when the protocol was being muted, we reeled against it and we warned that it would probably deliver, it would most certainly deliver an Irish sea border. Sadly, some Unionists at that point called it a serious and sensible way forward. We've all made mistakes. How little we understood of the complexity and the implications and the danger that the protocol actually posed. Not only the swales of the small and medium businesses that underpin our economy, but indeed the very agreement that brought peace to our beleaguered country. Today we're debating from each side of the argument, this good and should be welcomed. This is what these institutions are supposed to do, and sadly my first point is all too obvious. We do not have a functioning assembly or executive. The protocol has unarguably created instability for this legislature, whether we like it or whether we don't. We heard and saw the words and visuals that emanated from nationalist and republican politicians from this island, both north and south, in what turned out to be a stupendously partisan show of support from the Biden administration. That any border on this island between, between North and South delivered as a result of Brexit or any protocol would be contrary to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. The, the threat of resultant unrest quite obviously didn't go unnoticed by people like myself. But I need to be clear at this point, not once did the Ulster Unionist Party suggest that a land border could or should be the case. Not once did I hear or see an Ulster Unionist seek the imposition of a land border to deliver on Brexit. Nor did I hear a Unionist or other politician argue that a land border wouldn't upset the balance of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. The awareness of politicians across the piste on this matter was pretty much unanimous. This was a demonstration that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement was of huge import and should not be tampered with in regard to this protocol. Now, one be could, could be forgiven for expecting reciprocal understanding of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and its three strands. What it underpins for each community, what was democratically legislated for, and what delivered peace to all of us sitting in this chamber today. Sadly, this has turned out to not be the case. The REC border or protocol, which was created in a vacuum of democratic deficit of three years here without an assembly and executive due to the failure of Sinn Féin um, with, uh, to uh, respect democracy, coupled with the, the DUP, which squandered any influence it had, that it had at Westminster in the creation of a Brexit dividend, which might actually have seen Northern Ireland prosper properly, but actually cement its credentials as part of the UK. Many, if not all of you, will know that I'm not a politician that is prone to hyperbole or exaggeration, nor do I mischievously seek to undermine any party, any community, or any individual, or their legitimate right to see the Belfast Good Friday Agreement upheld. Sadly, upon delivery and implementation, it should have been obvious that the Northern Ireland Protocol was not only partisan in regard to the sovereignty of the EU single market and trade laws, but undermined the core basis of how the Good Friday Agreement is actually structured. It should have been clear and understood that Strand 1 has been ignored and that Strands 2 and 3 were afforded high regard. There could and should be much debate as to why this became the case. A Conservative government that was high on the fumes of getting Brexit done, or an EU that were intent on making the Brits pay for leaving the club. The truth is likely to be both. Sadly, what was birthed has created an instability that the people of Northern Ireland could not, should not, 
and will not afford. Addressing the democratic deficit for all of us in Northern Ireland and fixing the imbalance of disregarding Strand 1 of the Good Friday Agreement should provide those negotiating a solution impetus, uh, impetus to actually and accurately be able to put their names to an understanding of upholding all angles and commitments to the various uh, communities under the Good Friday Agreement. At a meeting recently with the Ways and Means Committee from the US here at Stormont, and amongst other questions, and queries, I asked Richie Neal, did the phrase suck it up resonate in America with the, and with the Biden administration? He said that he understood it. I then pointed out to him that the suck it up message from politicians, not only on this island, but indeed the EU and the US, was entirely the message that the unionist community were receiving loud and clear, and that message in no way reflected any bipartisan commitment to peace and stability. My second point, and one of you will indulge me, which is widely debated and harder to pin down, is the financial impact of the protocol. When we look at the facts, we must start from the point that only 5 to 10 per cent of the protocol has actually been implemented. Just last week at the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee, we heard from a leading haulier who said that the full implementation would grind the haulage business in Northern Ireland to a halt within 48 hours. Locally, I'm aware of one company who benefited from the pro protocol significantly, and much is made of this. However, when you unpick the detail, the reason that that business was successful is because they invested a quarter of a million pounds up front to be protocol ready. They had the money. But actually, the smaller businesses that went under who couldn't compete and weren't protocol ready were assumed into the bigger business. Is this really the, the financial benefit of the protocol? And just to finish, we really must be clear and, and, and unanimous that not only would the rigorous or further implementation of the protocol be destabilising for Northern Ireland, but it would be disastrous for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which was hard won, brought peace and offered a better future for all of our families across Northern Ireland and this island. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie, for that fantastic speech. It is now my pleasure to welcome the final speaker uh, for tonight's debate, Matthew Till, MLA. Matthew was previously a civil servant in Her Majesty's Treasury and 10 Downing Street, including working during the 2016 Brexit referendum and its aftermath. Upon leaving the civil service, Matthew worked as a journalist, writing widely on Brexit, its impact on Northern Ireland and Irish-British relations, before, before becoming an MLA for the Social Democratic and Labour Party in South Belfast in January 2020. In July 2022, Matthew was appointed Leader of the Opposition Instrument on behalf of the SDLP by his party leader, Colm Eastwood. I have an immense pleasure to welcome the final speaker for tonight's debate, Matthew Till. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I don't know whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage um, to be going uh, last. Uh, having heard sterling speakers uh, come before me, I shouldn't perhaps use the phrase sterling, given it's uh, not worth a lot these days. Um, <laughs> I obviously rise to uh, <clears throat> conclude and oppose the proposition uh, that this House believes the protocol has negatively affected Northern Ireland, not because I believe the protocol is by itself a perfect object, but because the protocol is a consequence of Brexit. It is, to use a phrase that was bandied about in Northern Ireland politics during the early days of the peace process, inextricably linked to Brexit. It is uh, one in the same as Brexit. A large part of the unionist opposition to the protocol uh, is predicated on the idea that Northern Ireland should not, must not be treated any differently from the rest of the United Kingdom. And while I have some sympathy with unionist opposition to the protocol, indeed I acknowledge and affirm, and despite what many say, including some have said today, I have never, ever, and I'm almost red in the face, though I'm red in the face anyway, um, I never lose an opportunity to say I acknowledge and affirm that unionists don't like the Northern Ireland Protocol. But the idea that Northern Ireland is exactly the same as the United Kingdom is a fantasy. It's a fabrication and it is, has been a complete fabrication since this place existed. You don't have to go, and you don't even have to uh, think about our institutions now. Look around you. Look at the chamber that we are in now. And as others have said, it's richly ironic that we're here today. And I'm glad that Litterific is here having this debate, given that we've had so little debate in the Northern Ireland Assembly. But this 
was the original Senate chamber of the old Northern Ireland Parliament. When Ireland was partitioned 101 years ago, the Northern Ireland Parliament with two chambers, a House of Commons down that way and a Senate chamber here was created. There's a throne behind me, a throne. If you look at that portrait up there, that doesn't actually, isn't actually in this building, but it was the then King George V and Queen Mary opening the Northern Ireland Parliament. I'm sure something that is treasured and understandably by many Unionists. No other part of the United Kingdom had a devolved Parliament in 1921 or 1922. They weren't given the right to make their own laws in 1921 or 22. They didn't have a convention as Northern Ireland did for the first half century of its existence, something that obviously most nationalists and non-unionists weren't particularly bought into, but they didn't have a convention at that time which suggested that no British MP could mention governance in Northern Ireland. But Northern Ireland did. Northern Ireland did. I simply list that history in that context in order to disprove and I'm afraid object fundamentally to the idea that Northern Ireland has always or indeed ever been precisely the same as the rest of the United Kingdom. Because of its geography, because of its history and because of our situation, whether you are unionist or nationalist, we have always been distinct and unique. And of course, there are countless areas when those who are most opposed to the protocol have also been most opposed to uh, the delivery of rights in this place which would be consistent with the rest of the UK, whether the, that, those rights relate to female bodily autonomy or whether they relate, or whether they relate to uh, the ability to marry who you choose. So let's not have discussions about equality inside the United Kingdom when very often and for decades it was denied to women and LGBT people here. I just want to go through some of the other points that were made uh, uh, in favour of uh, the proposition. One was uh, that, um, uh, as I said, unionist uh, concerns, Ryan made this point that unionist concerns had been dismissed. No, they haven't. At no point have unionist concerns been dismissed. I've never dismissed them. No one has ever dismissed them. But dismissing a concern, uh, there's a difference between acknowledging a concern and having the ability to do exactly what uh, uh, unionist politicians want. That's not in my power. The EU single market exists and it's going to continue to exist. Diane uh, talked uh, about the question of parallel consent, of dual consent. As has been said uh, well by speakers on my side, parallel consent uh, is, is something of a red herring when it comes uh, to international treaties. Ryan made great play of the fact that it is a reserved power for the UK, i.e. the sovereign government in Northern Ireland, though I would wish it otherwise in the future, that the UK government is able to make and conclude treaties. Yes, it is. That includes the protocol. That includes the protocol. I'm happy to give way. Uh, yeah, well, I still make the point um, that we should, in striving to achieve any solution, should try, and should have tried, and the motion is looking back at the problem of thought, should have tried to ensure the maximum possible consent for the the community and clearly there is a lack of consent from the Indian community in Northern Ireland. I'm glad you said that, Ryan, because you're right, we should have tried to achieve maximum consent from all portions of the population. The way to do that is first of all to have an assembly in which people can give voice and an executive in which they can give voice to views. Secondly, to uh, agree a close relationship between the UK and the EU because I'm afraid there is no hard Brexit that achieves cross-community consent. Kate Nicholl talked about the trilemma. That's exactly right. If you're going to diverge from EU rules and the customs union, I'm afraid it's impossible to not have a threshold uh, uh, of regulation somewhere. And let's not, let's not, by the way, fall for this myth, this lie that there is no new barriers to trade on the island of Ireland. There are loads. They're just largely invisible. The protocol only, Jim talks about the 65% of laws relating to our economy. I'd like to know where he gets that statistic from, but the truth is it only relates to the movement of goods. Other than the movement of goods uh, and some uh, uh, regulation in relation to electricity and the single electricity market, I think rather important that we're able to keep the, the lights on, particularly this winter, that most of our economy is governed, uh, is most, of our gov most of our economy is trade and services, which is not covered by the protocol. This place, this society, if it's to remain in the United Kingdom will have to reflect the duality, the fact that it's changing, the fact that it is both British and Irish. And I would ask those uh, uh, proposing the motion, and I would say respectfully to, to, to many unions, particularly in the DUP, that the future cannot be exactly like the past. Hard Brexit is a choice, and that choice means consequences. It means that we need a set of arrangements which reflects the duality of this place. You may not like that, but I'm afraid that's the way it is 
uh, after hard Brexit happened. And if we cannot sustain and agree and deliver a set of arrangements under the protocol, yes, by all means, smooth it so that goods can be smooth in terms of how they arrive in Northern Ireland. But if that set of arrangements cannot be made to work, then people, including in this room, will be forced to ask a more fundamental question, not just uh, about a, a dual future for Northern Ireland, but about a European future for this whole island. Uh, I uh, oppose the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew, for your fantastic speech. It is now my pleasure to turn our attention to questions from the floor. So if you have a question for the opposition, or proposition, sorry, uh, which is this side of the room, can you raise your hand now, please, if you have one for the proposition? Yes, please state your name as well. Uh, um, Ms. Gold, I think the phrase you used was diverse economic policy. You can kind of negative impact of the world. Um, Surely, given the past three or four weeks of the most crazy new terms of economic policy that has put the economy in the game. Surely some kind of divergence and which there's a bit of stability here in the world will benefit us. Um, so thank you for your question. Um, and uh, again, very much appreciated. The divergence that really we're talking about is divergence in policy, for example, divergence on state aid policy and competition policy. Um, divergence um, on um, standards, environmental standards, etc. You think government have said there'll be no lowering the standards, they want to go higher in standards. Um, but there are some issues around, and I could go very um, arcane examples around many uh, for animals where the EU have actually lowered their standards somewhat over the last while. So there will be divergence. There will be divergence. And if we consider that um, Northern, uh, GB is Northern Ireland's biggest market, the biggest market that we buy things from, and the biggest market that we sell things to, then divergence from that market will be um, a, an issue as we move forward. Can I also say that divergence in terms of new trade deals is also very, very important. And if you look at the Japan trade deal, for example, that sets the template for our trade deals that the United Kingdom have negotiated. So this, is a, this isn't a roller over an EU trade deal. This is a single trade deal negotiated between the UK and Japan. And that actually says, that actually says that, um, I'll paraphrase it, that um, where um, the trading arrangements between Japan and the UK um, diverge from the protocol, then the protocol always wins. That leaves our companies, that leaves our companies in the worst of all worlds, not quite in fully into UK trade deals, not in EU trade deals, but somewhere in that middle minimum as well. That's a very difficult position going forward for companies in Northern Ireland. That will increase, that will not decrease. And that will also increase the amount of competition law, by taxation, etc., etc. as we move forward. That leaves Northern Ireland in the Thank you. Opposition to respond? Yeah. <laughs> well, if you'll have to do yeah. whichever one you want. I actually, I'm really glad we talked about standards there because as was shown last year, the representatives from the uh, from the US and from India have said that the that uh, the UK standards and the EU standards are too high at the moment and are a barrier to trade. So whenever it comes to the UK government, which refused to enshrine food standards in law, whenever it comes to them needing new trade deals with uh, the Brit with the US and with India and with other countries, I like to protect myself with EU standards because, you know, I don't know about you, Tom, but whenever I go to Chippy for a chicken burger, I'm glad it's not covered in chlorine. So <laughs> I think I'm fairly happy with that divergence. And as you said, the latest economic turmoil, well, I would rather put my trust in the EU than put my trust in trust, or, well, I suppose it's now Rishi Sunak, who, <laughs> I mean, can we really trust a man richer than the king to? really hone in on Northern Ireland's working people, I think I'll stick with the diversion. Thank you. We can't go back and forth, apologies. Uh, does anyone have a question for the opposition? Put your hand up if you've a question for this side of the room. Someone has one, come on. Sure. Oh, sorry. Please state your name as well when you're asking a question. Uh, Peter Robinson, 
I feel like the main issue has been addressed by the opposition. Can you not see the hypocrisy in saying that it's impossible for there to be an establishment of a trade barrier between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland with that good extent for the people of Northern Ireland, yet it is possible for there to be a trade barrier between us and the rest of the United Kingdom? Yes, and I think, um, I think this is a big university challenge. Um, <laughs> Opposition to the um, The answer to your question, Peter, is there are new trade barriers between the Northern Ireland and the Republic, as I said in my speech. So, and you can remember what I believe in your pocket, I'm just coming closing there tonight. There's not a new, you know, a new legal guarantee that you can have a charge of your providers, but if you did that, you get the border, not just that you're on the border, if you're in the middle of the Sermon, the Dairy, they will send that eye, the Roman. No, there's new legal, previously on the digital single market, there was a legal protection. Uh, from roaming charges, you wouldn't be charged to get over uh, if you did room. There's no legal protection because that's not covered by the protocol. Financial services, you would lose the best thing from the south. AIB is basically choosing the best thing from the north or wide. And the financial services market is whether or not that's in part because uh, the protocol does not cover financial services. It's harder to trade, to sell financial product from one than the EU single market outside. So you are right to say there are new barriers to trade between Northern Ireland and GDE. But that's largely in goods. There's a 70 percent, 80 percent, in fact, of the modern UK and Irish economies is trade and services, and that is not covered by the protocol. So the idea, as I've said, really that we're moving towards an economic United Ireland is unfortunately, from my perspective, that that happen is a lie. It's not true. It's not happening. It's hard. Yes, it's harder to do certain goods with paperwork from GB and Northern Ireland, but lose all the things that involve moving data, selling financial services, uh, moving digital uh, products. All sorts of intellectual property moving people. Facebook, you know, firms in Dublin can't move people to other offices in Belfast unless they're British and Irish British Irish citizens. Our economies are in many ways frustratingly from my perspective moving apart. So I, I do wish those who object to the protocol would acknowledge the limitations. I understand that people like Irish are trying to move from Northern Ireland, but please don't talk about the idea that there are new Irish between North and South because unfortunately there are many. Proposition to respond. I have to say Matthew did not address the question. The question was. Why should there be consent and respect for national opposition to trade borders north south, but no respect for unionist opposition to trade barriers in the United Kingdom? That was the question. And of course, he didn't answer it because there isn't an answer to that. Because it's a one way process that it's all about give and no take in this. It's all about give. As far as unions are concerned, you have to give up. You have to ascend to the partitioning of the United Kingdom uh, uh, in order to have an all island economy, which I think the understand that the politics knows that uh, creating an all island economy is about a stepping stone. But so uh, it is indisputably correct that those on the other side of this debate, whereas they proclaim some respect for the union's position. Barbary shred that respect by insisting you can't go border the north side because we don't like Mr. Rackard threatening it might be bad as we do, but you unions just suck up the fact that there's going to be a border in the Irish. Thank you. Do we have any final opposition or sorry, abstention questions? Yes, please state your name. Yes, um, I found it interesting that your speech is on either side of the house. Um, the sort of each each side was was telling us how principles of democracy were enshrined in their position and argued that their side of the house, their argument fundamentally came to a place where their perspective would be better for the UK and for the Union. Um, and I wonder if, if you could articulate either side could articulate where they believe the fundamental either misunderstanding or, or misrepresentation of those principles and those ideas are. Um, because how can you both be so diametrically opposed to those I don't understand really. But is it not fundamental? It's the question that the opposition is not answer. It's a fundamental hallmark of this protocol that you subject yourself to foreign laws you can't be uh, and can't change. And you meekly and willingly accept that colonial position. Now, that flies in the face of any democratic accountability. And that is the fundamental hallmark of this protocol. That where this protocol is operated, the people of Northern Ireland have to be ruled by foreign jurisdiction. Now, how did that ever be compatible with democratic accountability?
opposition to respond? Final yeah, point. I'll come in. Um, look, I was going to just answer your question. The fundamental misunderstanding we have here is that those in support of the proposition um, or those who oppose the Northern Ireland Protocol, at the heart of this is the fact that they didn't get a version of Brexit that they wanted. And they want a hard version of Brexit that the people of this place didn't actually vote for in the first place. I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding there. I actually thought you were No, no back and forth. No back and forth. But, um, and I also just wanted to flag also what uh, Joe was saying around this whole concept that, oh, we don't want the border along the land because we don't want it, and that's all it is. I live in Savannah, I'm five hours from the border. I cross my living room and I get a roaming message for doing so. And I can tell you, as someone who lives along the border and who does not describe themselves as a nationalist, I'd like to make the point that we really do need to move beyond this nationalist and this narrative with this conversation, but also to make the point that it is simply not practical. No it's back and forth, no back and forth. The reality is <laughs> cross border living is something that impacts people who live along this border. There are thousands of people who are No back and forth, no back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it is now my pleasure to turn our attention to the vote on speaker ability. Now, it is very important that all members in the House know this is not a motion or a vote on what your opinion is. It is a vote on who you think has spoken the best. In many debates, I have seen the vote be almost identical to what the vote on prior opinion was. And I would ask members to genuinely vote for speaker ability on this occasion, please. So, if you believe the proposition have spoken best at tonight's debate, please raise your hand now. Well, this is up in the cross, isn't it? Twenty-nine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you think the opposition have spoken best at tonight's debate, please use your hand. No. Twenty-five. If you wish to abstain on the motion this evening, please raise your hand. No. I'm surprised that the Alliance MLAs are not responding to that. That's such a question. <laughs> Four? <laughs> Do you have the final number, Susie? So there were 29 votes for the proposition, 25 votes for the opposition, and for abstention, Sophie, the opposition, Alex. Thank you very much. That concludes today's debate. I would ask uh, one final thing is our next debate uh, at Queen's on this Thursday is this House would abolish mandatory coalition, which is quite uh, topical for this week as well. Um, so if you wish to attend that debate, it is 7 p.m. in the Senate Chamber at Queen's this Thursday. And I would also ask the speakers to stay behind and get a photo at the end. We'll also get a photo of all of you with the speakers, hopefully. If if you can stay around for two minutes at the, the steps of Stormont as well, where we got a photo earlier. So, finally, is a massive thank you to all our speakers this evening and for all of you for coming. Uh, thank you very much. And see you later. Oh, sorry. That's a good point. Uh, for those of you who are slightly younger, uh, there is a, we're going to Lavery's, uh, a private room in oh, Lavery's. The spikers are invited, I assume they were, they were the business. Uh, they are welcome to attend. We're going to Lavery's um, and we can all join there to have a chat afterwards. So if you want to come down, feel free. Thank you very much.